I think we can all agree that Intel's launch last week didn't really go as well as we all had hoped it would go, and then especially so when it comes to gaming. So we did quite a bit of extra testing over the weekend and we got some pretty interesting results that I'm going to talk about in this video because some things can very much so improve Intel's performance while others can make it even worse. So today I'll be looking at memory scaling and if faster memory improves your performance as well as core isolation because Intel actually suggested that core isolation should be enabled but it might actually lower your FPS instead. So without further ado, let's dive in. The CPU I was using for testing is the Core Ultra 9 285K paired up with the ASUS ROG Z890 Hero motherboard and the Rugen 3 Extreme all-in-one cooler to make sure that there is no thermal throttling. And for the memory, I have the new G-Skill DDR5-8200 CU DIMM memory kit and as always, I used an RTX 4090 graphics card from NVIDIA. Now, after the launch, we actually had a BIOS update, a Windows update, and a new NVIDIA driver. So uh, all the data you see in this video is collected with all these new updates applied. So please do keep that in mind. So let's start with memory scaling. The first game I wanted to look at was Microsoft Flight Simulator, where Intel was behind AMD by a big margin in my 265K review. There is a nice improvement in 1% lows, uh, going from DDR5 6000 to 6400, but going beyond that doesn't seem to help too much. There's basically no difference going up to 7200, and only a tiny bit of an improvement going all the way up to 8200. Counter-Strike 2 is another game that performed poorly with Intel and uh, looking at this graph, I think it's pretty clear that using much faster memory uh, doesn't solve the problem of Intel scoring in the low 300s, while the 7800X3D was closer to 500 FPS. Still, there is about a 5% of an improvement in average FPS and 8% improvement in 1% lows, uh, going from 6000 to 8200 or about 4% of an improvement in both average and 1% lows if you compare DDR5 6400 to 8200. PUBG showed a big gap with AMD as well, uh, where the 265K averaged 493 FPS and the 7800X3D about 550 FPS. Now this was tested in a training area, uh, which does run higher frame rates than a regular match, but a regular match is impossible to control for variables and higher FPS does allow for better CPU scaling. Now, obviously this is a different CPU, but seeing 640 plus FPS only one week later uh, means that one of the recent updates has likely fixed a possible problem that was present in this game at launch. Scaling is mostly linear here with about uh, a 5% of a gap in average and 7% of a gap in 1% lows when going from DDR5 6000 to 8200. So it is not a huge difference, uh, but it is still significant. World War Z was another game with a fairly big deficit for Intel. And here, faster memory will actually make a bit more of a difference. Uh, just going from 6000 to 6400 already shows a 5% improvement in average FPS and more than 10% in 1% lows. The differences are smaller as you go for even faster memory, but for this game, uh, faster memory does look very appealing. Baldur's Gate 3 is in a very similar position, uh, just going from DDR5 6000 to 6400 already shows a significant gain. And even going up to 7200 makes a pretty big impact. The difference between 7200 and 8200 is insignificant, but still, getting a gap of 12% in average FPS and almost 20% in 1% lows uh, between the slowest and the fastest memory is a very good result. In Watch Dogs Legion, you can gain about 5% average FPS and a bit more than that in 1% lows just by going from DDR5 6000 to 8200. Far Cry 6 is another Ubisoft game, uh, but this one is a little bit more memory sensitive. Uh, just going from DDR5 6000 to 6400 is enough to get you almost 5% of a gain and almost another 5% in average FPS by going up to uh, DDR5 8200. And finally, in Cyberpunk 2077, uh, going up to DDR5 6400 does give you a few extra frames in both average and 1% lows 
and the difference between DDR5 6000 and 6400 is about the same as between DDR6400 and 8200. So in some games that performed poorly at launch, uh, you can definitely squeeze out a bit more performance by increasing the memory speed. But should you enable or disable core isolation? For the last couple of years, uh, we've been testing with core isolation off because uh, in the earlier days of Windows 11, it was pretty clear that if you enable it, it would generally hurt your gaming performance. And uh, we also left it off for our Intel Core 7 265K review that I posted last week. However, according to Intel, uh, core isolation should not hurt performance anymore, and even more so, if you disable it, you might see worse results. Uh, but let's see some actual results here. In Microsoft Flight Simulator, there's about a 10% of an increase in both average and 1% low FPS uh, if you turn core isolation off. And that difference is visible with DDR5-6000 as well as 8200. That means that with the same CPU, uh, changing the memory and one window setting might affect your 1% low performance by more than 20%. In Counter-Strike 2, uh, core isolation does a lot less. Uh, there's a very small improvement with core isolation turned off, uh, but 1-3% to of a difference is too small to actually draw some conclusions. Now PUBG is very interesting because here uh, the average frame rates look really similar, but uh, turning core isolation off actually hurts 1% low performance by about 5%. And at these frame rates, this is probably nothing that you need to really worry about, but it also does show that in theory, uh, turning core isolation on might actually help performance in some uh, rare cases. In World War Z, it is uh, flipped again, uh, with small but significant gains when you turn it off, while in Baldur's Gate 3, the differences are a bit bigger, especially in the 1% low results with the slower memory. Watch Dogs Legion shows the exact same story. Uh, if DDR5-6000 is the baseline, uh, turning core isolation off will actually grant you the same benefit as buying much faster memory, and doing both is obviously ideal. Which applies to Far Cry 6 as well. So core isolation off is clearly better, and it can benefit you as much as faster memory can, and doing both will get you about 20% of an improvement. And finally, Cyberpunk 2077, uh, which shows some of the biggest gains from core isolation being disabled. Uh, even at DDR5-6000, your frame rate goes up by more than 15%, and if you combine uh, core isolation off with faster memory, you can gain more than 25% of average FPS and 1% low FPS compared to DDR5-6000 with core isolation on. So if you look at all of these results, uh, only PUBG showed the slightest bit of evidence that maybe uh, in some rare cases, uh, enabling core isolation might actually help performance by a bit. But overall, it is very clear that turning core isolation off is the best way to go for gaming, because in most games, you will see significant performance gains. So any suggestion made by Intel that core isolation should no longer hurt the performance is just wrong. And when it comes to memory speeds and which memory should you buy if you decide to go for the Intel Core uh, Ultra CPUs, well, uh, going from DDR5-6000 to 6400 showed a difference of 3% or less in 5 out of 8 games and 4% or more in 3 out of 8 games we've tested. The difference is a bit bigger with 1% low, so I would say that aiming for uh, DDR5-6400 is definitely worth it, especially when you consider that it usually doesn't cost uh, that much more. If we compare DDR5-6000 to 8200 with core isolation on, uh, there's a 5-6% to gap in 5 out of 8 games and a gap of 10% or more in 3 out of 8 games. With core isolation off, uh, there's about a 5-9% to of a gap in all games we've tested for this video, so memory is definitely a significant factor. But given how expensive DDR5 8200 currently is, and I still haven't seen prices for CU DIMM memory at all, it might not be justifiable upgrading your memory if you already have a system that is running DDR5 6000 or 6400. But 
If you're planning a completely new uh, high-end system from scratch and you're just looking to spend anywhere between uh, $2,000 to $5,000 or euros for the whole system, uh, spending $100 or $200 more on much faster memory is not that much of a stretch in my opinion. Anyway, uh, that is all I had for now, but before I go, let's check out the sponsor of this video. This video was brought to you by Seasonic and their Vertex power supplies. These fully modular power supplies are extremely efficient and very quiet due to their fan design and their hybrid fan mode that stops the fans completely under 40% load. They come with a variety of connections for any kind of system you have in mind, including the 12 volt high power cable for the latest NVIDIA graphics cards. And to wrap it all up, they now offer a nice and cozy 12 year long warranty. Check them out using the links in the description below. Thank you all for watching and staying to the end. I really hope this video was interesting enough and helpful enough. Uh, we are still testing here and working on quite a few more videos. So if you want to make sure that you don't miss those, uh, please do consider clicking that subscribe button. Bye guys and I will see you in the next one. Bye!